going to do something a little different for this guide. I'm going to work without a script and off the cuff, as I think that's the best way for me to get through it. And I'll say at the outset that I'm not presenting anything close to an orthodox interpretation of this work or this philosopher here, but I don't care. What I want to talk about is Thus Spoke Zarathustra, the book for all and none by the German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche. This book is written in the late 19th century at the, not quite at the end of Nietzsche's life, but the at towards the end of his working life. He he went mad late in life, and this work was actually his favorite work. And the work, the interpretation I want to present, or the view of it that I want to present here, is that the reason why you would read this book and why it's important is that it is a kind of vestibule or entryway into the philosophic works of Nietzsche. And if you think Nietzsche is an important philosopher with something to say, then this is a useful work for you. And if you are a person who sees the current state of the world as one of nihilism or in danger of something related to nihilism, a collapse of values, a collapse of faith, then also this work and the work of Nietzsche might be of interest to you. And the reason I call it that is that that is the sense in which I understand this book. The sense in which it's a book for all and none is that it's for none because it really is just a record in some respects of Nietzsche himself coming to his own philosophy. And it's for all in the sense that it is obviously public and accessible in principle to anybody who can read it and try to understand it. But as you read it, I think it will open itself up to you as a work that is guiding you to what is Nietzsche doing, not only in this work, but in all his works. What is he trying to do? And what he's trying to do is what is established in the prologue and then in some pivotal discourses in the later book, which is namely he is trying to create a, create a new elite, a philosophical elite, but not uh, interested in doing philosophy in the Platonic sense, but interested in doing philosophy in the Nietzschean sense, in the sense that it must be done, in Nietzsche's view, now that the Western world has reached some kind of terminal point or some kind of danger point, at the very least, where its belief in itself and its belief in its old values is, is collapsing or has collapsed. I, I don't think you could say it has collapsed in Nietzsche's time, uh, but for now, yes, I think you could say that it basically has collapsed. And that is a situation that Nietzsche foresaw as necessarily growing out of what was happening in his time and attempts to do something about. In one, one of the pivotal chapters, which I'll discuss later, he says, I see a great darkness coming. Alas, how shall I preserve my light through it? That's what he's talking about. When Zarathustra realizes, oh, I was not come to address the many, but to win some few away from the herd, again, that's what he's talking about. He's talking about creating this new elite, philosophical elite, but a Nietzschean philosophical elite. And that's what his works attempt to do. His works attempt to, because when you read them, he'll say things like a work creates its own audience in a way. Um, and that's what he's trying to do, is trying to, in a way, choose his followers. Because the kind of people who would be interested in his writing and what he has to say are basically who he wants. You know, if you're the sort of person that's going to be interested in this, then then he wants you to read it. And he wants you to uh, be baffled by it and amused by it and interested by it and in inspired by it and go out to create uh, as a result of it. And what he wants you to think, well, to some degree, and do is is in here. You know, it's it's in this work and in his philosophic works. And what I, my the reading I want to present today is a reading that kind of justifies this take that I've just presented, that, that, it, that it is a sort of vestibule to his philosophy, that it is an important guide to his philosophy. And if you're not familiar with this work, 
you should keep in mind that it is written, it's written sort of like a, a novel and also written in a sort of religious tone or with the tonality of uh, uh, religious texts, which can give it a, an, an interesting sort of effect. But it's not, it's not a philosophical treatise. It's, it's, uh, it's written like a book. It's written like a novel. I'll just want to take a look at the prologue and a pivotal chapter uh, or discourse in the in the book because I think these can provide a very good and useful entry into the work for those who want to study it on their own. So uh, if you take a look at the prologue and where it begins, this is not a book about attaining wisdom. It's a book about really about politics and education because the issue of the book is how do you convey your message to others how do you get men to buy into what you have to say let's take a look at the beginning to see how this appears from the very start when Zarathustra was 30 years old he left his home and the lake of his home and went into the mountains there he enjoyed his spirit and solitude, and for ten years did not weary of it. But at last his heart changed, and rising one morning with the rosy dawn, he went before the sun and spoke thus to it. Great star, what would be your happiness if you had not those for whom you shine? For ten years have you climbed thus to my cave. You would have wearied of your light and of the journey had it not been for me, my eagle, and my serpent. But we waited you every morning, took from you your overflow, and blessed you for it. I am weary of my wisdom, like the bee that has gathered too much honey. I need hands outstretched to take it. I would gladly bestow and distribute until the wise have once more become joyous in their folly, and the poor happy in their riches. Therefore must I descend into the deep, as you do in the evening when you go behind the sea, and give light also to the netherworld, exuberant star. Like you, I must go down, as men say, to whom I shall descend. So that's the, the setup. He's obtained wisdom, and he knows he has to go down. And go down, uh, the, the, the German word that he uses also is a way of saying to perish, to die. Uh, I must go down to men. If you're familiar with the history of philosophy, you know that uh, this has been an image used to describe the philosopher speaking to normal men. Uh, it's an image that was used perhaps most famously of all by Plato in the allegory of the cave. So in the Republic, Socrates presents the allegory of the cave as a way of describing what normy life is. And normy life is human beings ch in a cave chained to the rocks and looking at shadows on the wall. You know, there's fire behind them and people carrying images and the shadows of those images that are thrown on the cave walls. That's what people think normal life is. That is how they experience normal life. And he says, well, if you were to escape from your chains and go up into the light and see the sun and see things as they are, what would then happen if you were to go down, meaning go back down into the cave? And in fact, the whole Republic itself begins with the phrase, I went down. I went down to the Piraeus yesterday. Uh, so uh, this whole idea of going down is a crucial element in that book. I, I can't help but think that Nietzsche must have it in mind. But he says, uh, to, to return to the allegory, Socrates says, if you were to return to normal men, they would think you a fool or a bad person, you know, because your, your eyes having been adjusted to the light, are not going to be adjusted to the dim light of the cave. You're not going to really be able to describe the images on the wall well. In fact, you might be aware of what's actually causing them, and so you, you'll be much less impressed by them, or much less interested in naming them, um, or being fascinated by them. And that's kind of the experience of those who have left normie life behind is similar to this. How do you go back? How do you go back and talk to these people in a way that they can understand? And that's going to be the problem that Zarathustra confronts in this book. And that is the setup of the whole book because that's the first part of the prologue. 
the end of this first part, at the end of this first part, Zarathustra says, this cup is again going to empty itself, and Zarathustra is again going to be a man. Thus began Zarathustra's down going. And so he goes down the mountain, and the first person he meets is an old hermit, a religious hermit, um, who recognizes him. He remembers him going up into the mountains, but he notices that he's changed. Altered is Zarathustra. A child has Zarathustra become. An awakened one is Zarathustra. What will you do in the land of the sleepers? As in the sea have you lived in solitude, and it has borne you up. Alas, will you now go ashore? Alas, will you now drag your body yourself? Zarathustra answered, I love mankind. So the, the old hermit is noting that, you know, what are you going to do? When you go to men they, that, who are like those asleep, um, you've lived in your solitude. Uh, how are you going to carry yourself to them? And when Zarathustra says, I love mankind, the saint's response is, well, why did I go into the forest and the desert? Was it not because I loved men far too well? There's a type of person, um, uh, I think of someone like Ted Kaczynski, who can't deal with the normies. <laughs> it becomes... Uh, impossible to deal with them. And if you have some love of mankind, seeing them in their normy state can be almost too much to bear. And in the case of this, this kind of person, the sage or the saint, and sages and saints in the West and also in the East have long sought solitude in the mountains or the desert just as a way of getting away from normal mankind. But the real issue as Plato says in Republic and as Nietzsche realizes here is, okay, you can, you can attain your wisdom. How then do you go back to man and speak to them? How do you convey that wisdom in some way? And Zarathustra says, well, I'm bringing gifts to men. The saint says, give them nothing. Take rather part of their load and carry it along with them. That will be most agreeable to them, if only it be agreeable to you. So this is not bad advice. Normies, if you can show that, oh, I'm going to help you out in some way or carry your burden in some way, they'll respond to that. If you write a self-help book um, that's of any value, you'll sell a million copies. Things that are perceived as that kind of, oh, you read this book, this one weird trick, it'll solve your problems they'll eat that stuff up. That's a way of, in a way, carrying their burdens for them. That, that's the kind of thing they like. But that's not what Zarathustra is offering. And so now the saint gives them a warning. Then see to it that they accept your treasures. They are distrustful of anchorites and do not believe that we come with gifts. The fall of our footsteps rings too hollow through their streets. And just as at night when they are in bed and hear a man abroad long before sunrise, so they ask themselves concerning us, where goes the thief? And, and a modern equivalent might be if you're speaking to a normie and you try to convey the idea of 13 do 50, or you try to convey the idea of IQ differences, or you try to bring up certain tribes. You'll soon hear from people, why do you even know about that? Why do you care about that? Where goes the thief? They don't, that kind of questioning, uh, they don't take it well. Uh, and a person who, by asking those kind of questions, identifies themselves as a non-normie, as a recluse of some sort, an anchorite, they don't believe you are offering them a gift. They believe you're a thief. They believe you're a problem. And so the saint says, don't, don't go to men, go to animals. So the Zarathustra asks him, well, what, what do you do? What does the saint do in the forest? I make hymns and sing them. And in making hymns, I laugh and weep and mumble. Thus do I praise God. With singing, weeping, laughing, and mumbling, do I praise the God who is my God. But what do you bring us as a gift? When Zarathustra had heard these words, he bowed to the saint and said, what should I have to give you? Let me rather hurry hence, lest I take something away from you. And thus they parted. So Zarathustra is not a new atheist type. He's not here to convince this old man that his worshiping of God is foolishness. But when they leave, he does say to himself, is this possible that the old saint in the forest has not yet heard that God is dead? So that's the condition of things as Nietzsche sees it and as Zarathustra uh, sees it in the book, that 
The old man's way is not a viable way because he doesn't believe in God. Things have reached a point for him that there's no belief in these supernatural things. But the loss of that belief presents a huge problem, which in the very next uh, part, part three of the prologue, uh, that's immediately what Zarathustra launches into when he reaches his first town. So he has his first encounter with the religious hermit, and we learn that one of the crucial elements of his wisdom is that God is dead, and we get the next crucial element uh, of his wisdom here, which is the lesson, the positive vision, and a lot of people in dissident circles talk about positive and negative visions. He offers both, so he'll offer a positive vision and then a negative vision. And he starts out with a positive vision. He reaches the town. He finds many people assembled in the marketplace because they're there to see a show. A rope dancer would give a performance or so it had been announced. And he speaks to the people. He just sort of blurts it out. I teach you the overman, the ubermensch, or the superman. Man is something that is to be surpassed. What have you done to surpass man? All beings hitherto have created something beyond themselves. Do you want to be the ebb of that great tide? Would you rather go back to the beast? than to surpass man? What is the ape to man, a laughingstock, a thing of shame? And just the same shall man be to the overman, a laughingstock, a thing of shame. You've made your way from the worm to man, and much within you is still worm. Once you were apes, and even yet man is more of an ape than any ape. Even the wisest among you is only disharmony and hybrid, plant and phantom. I teach you the overman. The overman is the meaning of the earth. Let your will say, the overman shall be the meaning of the earth. I conjure you, my brethren, remain true to the earth. Believe not those who speak to you of super earthly hopes. Poisoners are they, whether they know it or not. Despisers of life are they, decaying ones and poison themselves, of whom the earth is weary. So away with them. Once blasphemy against God was the greatest blasphemy, but God died and therewith also the blasphemers. To blaspheme the earth is now the dreadfulest sin and to rate the heart of the unknowable higher than the meaning of the earth. So his first positive vision is this idea that this idea of the overman, of man as being capable of transcending himself, becoming something more than himself, a transcendent ideal, is what we can use to take the place of of God. We aren't going to uh, we aren't going to put our hope in an eternal life or an afterlife that takes place after this earth. The earth is all we have, but we can still look to something of the future, creating something greater than ourselves. There can still be a way of achieving the nobility and the greatness of spirit that was achieved in past times thanks to belief in things beyond ourselves. That seems to be his positive vision or a crucial part of his positive vision. We can't rely on the past visions of things beyond, but what's the problem he runs into? So he teaches them this, and when he had spoken, one of the people called out, we have now heard enough of the rope dancer. It is time for us to see him. They want to see the show. And all the people laughed at Zarathustra, but the rope dancer who thought the words applied to him began his performance. They laugh. They laugh. And they, they're still laughing. Think about what is Nietzsche's teaching in the popular imagination. It's the Superman character. It's not this ideal of transcendence that's going to help us get through the period when, when man or humanity lost faith in God. It's an alien creature flying around in tight blue tights and a cape. It, it's, a, it's a caricature. It's a laughable thing. It's not Nietzsche's thing at all. The normie is still laughing at this concept. And if you try to convey it to them, they'd be like, oh, do you mean Superman? <laughs> You're not going to get it through to these people. Now, Zarathustra tries again. So in the next part, he, he speaks again. He says, man is a rope stretched between animal and over man, a rope over an abyss. And so he gives, he gives his next attempt to, he gives his own uh, version of the Beatitudes uh, instead of saying blessed is he, he says, I love him who I love him I love him who lives in order to know. I love him who labors and invents. I love I love him who loves his virtue. I love him who has uh, who wants to be holy, the spirit of his virtue, who makes his virtue his inclination, his destiny, his own version of sort of the beatitudes, if you will. But again, nothing. He gets nothing. 
When Zarathustra had spoken these words, he again looked at the people and was silent. There they stand, he said to his heart. There they laugh. They understand me not. I am not the mouth for these ears. So he tries another approach. So he tries a negative vision. Must one first batter their ears that they may learn to hear with their eyes? Must one clatter like kettle drums and penitential preachers? Or do they only believe the stammerer? They have something whereof they are proud. What do they call it? That which make them proud. Culture, they call it. It distinguishes them from goat herds. They dislike to hear of contempt, so I will appeal to their pride. I will speak unto them of the most contemptible thing, the last man. And so he speaks to them of that. It is time for man to fix his goal. It is time for man to plant the germ of his highest hope. Still is his soil rich enough for it, but that soil will one day be poor and exhausted, and no lofty tree will any longer be able to grow thereon. Alas, there comes the time when man will no longer launch the arrow of his longing beyond man, and the string of his bow will have unlearned to whiz. So part of Nietzsche's vision, or at least part of the vision as Zarathustra presents it, is that it is not open to man at any time and any place to achieve transcendence or to seek transcendence. It is possible through the historic process that man will become incapable of this, that man will reach a point of degradation wherein he can no longer become something great. He'll become something debased and reduced to that. And that is part of what gives Nietzsche's work its quality is that is that there's a sense of apocalyptic danger. There's a danger that man will no longer be able to achieve something. And he wants to stave that off. And so he goes on to say, there comes the time when man will no longer give birth to any star. Alas, there comes the time of the most despicable man who can no longer despise himself. I show you the last man. What is love? What is creation? What is longing? What is a star? So asks the last man, and they blink. The earth has become small, and on it there hops the last man who makes everything small. His species is ineradicable, like that of the ground flea. The last man lives longest. We have discovered happiness, say the last men, and they blink. They have left the regions where it is hard to live, for they need warmth. One still loves one's neighbor and rubs against him, for one needs warmth. Turning it ill and being distrustful, they consider sinful. Racism is the highest evil. They walk warily. He is a fool who still stumbles over stones or men. A little poison now and then that makes pleasant dreams, drugs, booze, and much poison at last for a pleasant death, euthanasia. One still works, for work is a pastime, but one is careful lest the pastime should hurt one. 30-hour work week, psychological uh, help at work, bosses asking people, how are you feeling these days? One no longer becomes poor or rich. Both are too burdensome. Who still wants to rule? Who still wants to obey? Both are too burdensome. You will own nothing and you will be happy. No shepherd and one herd. Everyone wants the same. Everyone is equal. He who has other sentiments goes voluntarily into the madhouse. Formerly all the world was insane, say the subtlest of them, and they blink. So his vision of the last man is essentially a vision of our elites now. Just to put it in perspective, this is what they want. They want to create what Nietzsche describes as the last man. They want to create this on a global scale. And they think that that's happiness. They think that they've discovered it. And that is what I think just looking at the state of liberalism in Nietzsche's own time and projecting forward, that's its logical endpoint. That's the logical endpoint of the philosophy as he saw it and as we are now working our way towards. But even this negative vision doesn't go anywhere. And in fact, it says this is uh, here ended the first discourse of Zarathustra called the prologue, where at this point the shouting and the mirth of the multitude interrupted him. Give us the last man, they called out. Make us into these last men. Then we will make you a present of the overman. And they exulted and smacked their lips. So he tries his negative, his positive vision, his negative vision, both fail. The normie doesn't want to hear it. You're not going to convince them. You're not going to win over the masses. So a movement that seeks to avoid a spiritual disaster or a cultural disaster for humanity is not going to be a mass movement. What's it going to be instead? 
Well, something interesting happens at this point. Uh, a death happens in the book. Then, however, something happened which made every mouth mute and every eye fixed. So the rope dancer is walking across his tightrope, and some buffoon comes out and mocks him, and then jumps over him. And uh, the tightrope walker loses his balance and falls to his death. Now, he doesn't die immediately, uh, but of course, because he falls and it's a great disaster, everybody runs away, right? So the marketplace and the people were like the sea when the storm comes on. They all flew apart and in disorder, especially where the body was about to fall. So they don't want to see death. They don't want to confront it. The man falls next to Zarathustra, who goes up to him and speaks to him. And the man asks Zarathustra to protect him from the devil coming to drag him off to hell. And Zarathustra says, well, there's, there's no such thing. There's no devil. There's no hell. Uh, and then the man says, well, then I've wasted my life. Zarathustra says, no, not at all. You may danger your calling. There's nothing contemptible in that. Now you perish by your calling. Therefore, will I bury you with my own hands. So this is an interesting little view of the kind of person in the normie world that you can still have respect for. And that's a person who makes danger their calling. I'm minded to think of this sort of residual respect people have for military personnel, but those who actually fight. I'm not counting desk jockeys in this. Um, you might you know, include something like uh, American football players. They, to some degree, they make danger their calling, and there's a certain respect in that. One has no respect for the, the people who watch, but the players, maybe you can, because to some degree, they do that as well. Uh, I think of a show like Mike Rowe's Dirty Jobs, people who do dirty or disrespected things. There's a certain respect in that as well. So I think this is a decent rule of thumb for what kind of person in the normie world one might still have some respect for. Um, and Zarathustra has respect for this person, and indeed he does bury him, but he has to take him away. And as he's taking the body away, he gets a couple of interesting lessons. And the first lesson is that the dissident is going to be hated and possibly put to death or certainly persecuted um, that is what Socrates had to look forward to. That is what Zarathustra has to look forward to. That is what people now have to look forward to. Um, so the buffoon who uh, jumped over the tightrope walker comes to him and says, leave this town, Zarathustra. There are too many here who hate you. The good and just hate you. Call you their enemy and despiser. The believers in the orthodox belief hate you and call you a danger to the multitude. It was your good fortune to be laughed at, and indeed, you spoke like a fool. It was your good fortune to associate with the dead dog. By so humiliating yourself, you saved your life today. Depart from this town, or tomorrow I shall jump over you, a living man over a dead one. You can think of a modern equivalent, someone like Alex Jones, who for a while, being a buffoon, saved him from trouble. But even then, eventually, they canceled him. They removed him from public discussion. Because the believers in the orthodox belief, which is which is not Christianity now, you know, it's it's global liberalism, the orth or whatever you want to call it, the orthodox belief, they hate him. The, they they are, they also call themselves the good and the just. They believe themselves to be the good and the just. And I'm not saying that like he's an overman or that he's a Zarathustra character, but he's a person they see as an enemy and they treat it as such, and that's how they'll treat buffoons who are their their enemies. So if that's how they treat an actual buffoon who's an enemy, you can imagine it's much worse for actual more dangerous enemies. That's his first lesson. But then his second lesson is one that comes to him after a night's sleep. He wakes up and realizes the key is not mass appeal. Don't go to the masses. The key is elite appeal. This was also the lesson uh, that Socrates learned you know, I'm not going to speak to the entire town of Athens. I'm going to speak to those who follow me, to those who are willing to engage with me. The philosopher will peel a few away. Not everybody, not the majority, but an elite few, perhaps. And the way Zarathustra puts it, it puts it is, I need companions. I need living companions who will follow me because they want to follow themselves and to the place where I will. A light has dawned upon me. Not to the people is Zarathustra to speak. But to companions, Zarathustra shall not be the herd's herdsman and hound, to allure many from the herd. For that purpose have I come. The people in the herd must be angry with me. A robber shall Zarathustra be called by the herdsman. Herdsman, I say, but they call themselves the good and just. Herdsman, I say, 
but they call themselves the believers in the orthodox belief. Behold the good and just. Whom do they hate most? Him who breaks up their tables of values. The breaker, the lawbreaker. He, however, is the creator. Companions, the creator seeks, not corpses and not herds or believers either. Fellow creators, the creator seeks, those who give new values on new tables. So this is it. His the, the goal is the training up of an elite. And what is necessary, there's one last detail. Uh, that's the end of uh, part nine of 10 of the prologue. And in part 10, there's one last little detail where Zarathustra uh, looks up and sees his animals, the eagle and the serpent, the proudest animal under the sun and the wisest animal under the sun. Um, and in a way, this is these are the two qualities that you'll need if you're going to walk a path apart from normie life. Uh, you're going to need pride. You're going to need wisdom. Um, and you're going to need them together. As he puts it, if my wisdom should so someday forsake me and it loves to fly away, then may my pride also fly away with my folly. I don't think that's bad advice either. Now I want to look at the pivotal discourse in the main work. So there's the prologue and then there's 80 discourses, making 81. And I think if you look at the central discourse, you see something very interesting there, which should also be kept in mind. It's also a key guide to what this work is and why it's important. So Discourse 41 is called The Soothsayer. And in some ways, The Soothsayer is Arthur Schopenhauer. There's a sign of why this issue with Zarathustra is so critical. His need of companions, his need of trying to get somebody to believe in his vision, the positive and the negative versions. So if you read the soothsayer, and I saw a great sadness come over mankind. The best turned weary of their works. A doctrine appeared, a faith ran beside it. All is empty, all is alike, all has been, and from all hills there re-echoed. Re all, all is empty, all is alike, all has been. To be sure, we have harvested, but why have all our fruits become rotten and brown? What was it fell last night from the evil moon? In vain was all our labor. Poison has our wine become. The evil eye has singed yellow our fields and hearts. Arid have we all become, and fire falling upon us. Then do we turn to dust like ashes. Yea, the fire itself have we made a weary. All our fountains have dried up. Even the sea is receded. All the ground tries to gape, but the depth will not swallow. Alas, where is there still a sea in which one could be drowned? So sounds our plaint across shallow swamps. Verily, even for dying have we become too weary. Now do we keep awake and live on in sepulchres. Thus did Zarathustra hear a soothsayer speak, and the foreboding touched his heart and transformed him. Sorrowfully did he go about and wearily, and he became like unto those of whom the soothsayer had spoken. Verily, said he unto his disciples, a little while... And there comes a long twilight. Alas, how shall I preserve my light through it, that it may not smother in this sorrowfulness? To remoter worlds shall it be a light, and also to remotest nights. This becomes a real problem, and it's the problem of nihilism. It's the problem of believing in nothing, the end of all beliefs, the collapse of values, because thanks to the revolution, the scientific revolution, there is no ground for our values. There's no ground. There's no reason for anything. There's no reason why to believe even in truth rather than not truth. You know, any argument you give is just a, it's a just so story. You know, oh, well, this will help us survive. Well, why is surviving even a value? Why is that better than just death? This is the postmodern dilemma. And Zarathustra is racked by this, you know, because he says, well, then how, how are my ideas going to survive through this? How is humanity going to survive through this? That's, that's the danger where the soil will become unable to give birth to something great after this kind of, uh, after decades of being educated in this kind of belief. Um, and we see it now, like we're seeing some of the fruits of this 
in our society now where the old values have lost basis and those who do have values, the values they have are horrific, to be frank. And so, but there are the values of just emptiness. You know, there's, oh, well, I guess we'll just keep going down this road of equality because that's the the political arrangement that we have, but it's it's nothing. This is the problem. This is a key problem that he confronts and a pivotal problem that that the book then turns on here. Remember, this is a central chapter and the rest follows from it. So I think that getting through that prologue and realizing the problem that it's setting up and then coming to the issue of this uh, discourse, Discourse 41, I think that provides you the key entry point into understanding what this work is all about. It's a work about how to how does one preserve one's light through the coming nihilism, the coming collapse of values, um, and how does one preserve it? Not for the masses because they're not going to be interested. They're not going to be uh, capable really of preserving it. You need to build up an elite cadre uh, that believes in it. And actually, what's interesting about the soothsayer chapter is Zarathustra talks about a dream he had. And in his dream, he's a night watchman and a grave guardian, uh, looking over sepulchers. I guarded the coffins of death. Full stood the musty vaults of those trophies of victory. Out of glass coffins did vanquished life gaze upon me. The odor of dust-covered eternities did I breathe. Sultry and dust-covered lay my soul, and who could have aired his soul there? Brightness of midnight was ever around me. Lonesomeness cowered beside her. And as a third, death rattles stillness, the worst of my female friends. Keys did I carry, the rustiest of all keys. And I knew how to open with them the most creaking of all gates. My reading of this is that the graves are the books of the great writers. It's Plato. It's Rousseau. Plato and Rousseau are two people that uh, Nietzsche mentions as specific uh influences on himself. He can analyze the books. He has the keys needed to un unlock the books, but it's, you know, it's vanquished life inside. It's not living. And then there's a, a knock at the gates. Three times did the vaults resound and howl, and I went to the gate. Who carries his ashes unto the mountains? Who carries his ashes unto the mountains? And he open, tries to open the gate. It wouldn't open. And then a roaring wind tore it apart, and it threw open a black coffin and out of the coffin spouted a thousand peals of laughter, a thousand caricatures of children, angels, owls, fools, and child-sized butterflies. They laughed and mocked and roared at me. Fearfully was I terrified thereby, it prostrated me, and I cried with horror as I ne'er cried before. But my own crying awoke me, and I came to myself. And he tells this dream, and his most beloved disciple interprets the dream um, that Zarathustra was himself the wind and he's going to blow unto his enemies. But Zarathustra just shakes his head at this. So what's going on here is that Zarathustra is confronting the problem of what do we do when we don't have the prospect of an afterlife or some kind of cosmic justice to redeem the injustices of this world and to redeem death. Uh, to give an example of what I mean, in another work, there's an aphorism where, where Nietzsche discusses the painter Raphael, and he says that some say that it's a shame that such a spirit died so young. And his reply is, the shame is that such a spirit has to die at all. He's confronting the problem of death, but it's not just death. There's also another factor, and it's also the factor of the past. One of the ways he deals with death is by turning to this concept of will or will to power. But the obstacle to will or will to power is, of course, the past, because the past is beyond human willing. It happened. So these two twin factors, the past and death, are things that he's trying to deal with. And so when we look at the glass coffins that he's overlooking as something like, you know, great artists, great writers and their works. That figure combines both of those factors. They are both fact they are both figures from the past and figures whom death has claimed. And the issue is how does one 
redeem this without reference to um, some kind of uh, afterlife, without reference to supernatural means, basically. Is there a way to do it? And Nietzsche seems to think that there is a way to do it. And that uh, he has a couple of doctrines that are involved in this. One is will to power, but the other factor is the doctrine of the eternal return, uh, this way of trying to will the past by willing it to return again in the future, willing it to return uh, endlessly in the future, if need be, as a way of overcoming the past by seeing it as something that could be again in the future. Um, it's a very odd doctrine and hard to explain, but again, the importance of it is set up by this uh, chapter on the soothsayer. What happens in his dream is that he's confronted with this problem and the horror of it awakens him. So I think if you have these ideas of what happens in the prologue and what happens in the soothsayer in mind, it can guide you through this work. And it can also then in turn guide you through the other works of Nietzsche. You can realize the problems he's facing, why he's facing them, and what uh, he tries to do about it, what his answers uh, are, or what his possible answers are.